You're listening to How I Sell, a podcast built for early career sales professionals. You'll hear stories, best practices, and guidance from top sales leaders on what it takes to become a sales superstar. Today's episode is made possible by Ramped Careers. Ramped is on a mission to build the next generation of workforce-ready talent. Joining us today is James Stone, Director of Sales at HubSpot. James is a HubSpot veteran, having spent close to a decade there and rising up the ranks from a BDR uh, to a sales leader today. Thank you so much, James, for joining us. Yeah, you got it. Happy to be here. Hey, James. For those that don't know who you are, who is James Stone? So uh, I'm a Boston bred uh, sales executive at HubSpot. Um, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, as I've been now pretty much in, uh, the COVID era for eight months, I, I live outside of Boston with, uh, with a new puppy. Um, and, uh, and really just, you know, I'm looking to help grow HubSpot sales team into the uh, sort of next phase of its growth. Nice, nice, nice. So, Taking you way back to the early part of your career, you know, coming out of college, how did you end up picking a career in sales? Um, so I think to answer that question, I'll even go, you know, while in college, uh, I was certainly one of those individuals that had no idea what path I really wanted to, to, to go down after graduation. You know, you naturally have a lot of friends who, you know, they're the ones that get the jobs at consultants, you know, they're, they're consultants and they have their job probably in September, October of senior year. You've got the people that want to go into law or medicine. I didn't fit any of those molds. Um, I looked at a variety of different roles and ultimately found myself uh, as an account manager at an advertising agency. Uh, I was local to Boston. It was attractive to me because it allowed me to do a variety of different things within business. Um, you know, I was able to work with clients. Uh, I was able to do things around operations, finance, some creative, you know, marketing components. And I thought it would be a really good first role to hopefully lead me, you know, or point me more or less towards the direction that I wanted to go. But after about five months, um, I wasn't happy. I, I really didn't like it. Um, I thought that the compensation was really, really low. That's always first. Um, but there were little things of like, you know, the people around me weren't like me. Like I didn't feel as if that I was comfortable and I shouldn't say like me, I'd say like shared the same interests, the same drives, the same motivations. Like I wanted more. Um, and I found myself after about five months sort of looking into what was it that I really enjoyed about the job. Hands down my favorite part, picking up the phone and speaking with the clients schmoozing, understanding what is that needed to get done, being like reliable um, and developing that relationship. And it just so happened I had a friend of mine interning at HubSpot uh, and I had a professor at Tufts who was very fond of HubSpot and they both pointed me in the direction of uh, their BDR program. So there was an entry level sales program at HubSpot. I was the second set of BDRs that was hired at the company. Um, yeah, so my, my training class when I started, it was literally five people. Uh, I think I just got wind. Our training class of salespeople alone this month is over a hundred. So, wow. um, yeah, like it, it's certainly, uh, uh, some scale. Um, but I sort of knew right away after starting that job, I was like, this is definitely more aligned of what it is that I want. I saw the career path of what sales reps, you know, were, were doing, how long they were in the office, what they were trying to accomplish. And I was like, this is exactly what I want. So sort of fell upon it. Impressive, impressive. And, and at HubSpot at the time when you joined, how many total people were there? There was probably anywhere from about 150 to 170 people. Um, wow. Just crazy. one office in Cambridge. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. So you saw quite a journey from start to, well, to where you are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, I was one of the people that, um, you know, was still interviewed by Brian Halligan, our CEO, like he even hired, you know, he, he, he interviewed a BDR, you know, um, you could say I was pretty nervous, uh, but <laughs> he left the room, the recruiter came in five minutes later and was like, you've got the job. So I obviously did something well. 
<laughs> That's incredible. You know, what's, uh, what's particularly interesting is that you kind of went from a, a BDR role to an inbound marketing specialist, which is, you know, honestly, a, a HubSpot specialty. I think a lot of folks know kind of what a BDR or an SDR role entails, but how is that different? What does it mean to be a inbound marketing specialist? And how is that different from the conventional SDR BDR role? Yeah. So, um, you know, tech companies and their, their, you know, creative names for salespeople and, and BDRs. But the short story is an inbound growth specialist or um, at back then, you know, an inbound specialist, we were, that's essentially an account executive, you're a sales representative. So um, I was a business development rep for five months, uh, effectively tasked with identifying companies, not in the HubSpot database, that would be good fits for HubSpot. Mm -hmm. um, really all cold outreach. None of these individuals we really reached out to knew of HubSpot at the time uh, and set up meetings for a team of account executives um, that uh, would then, you know, do discovery, qualification, they would demo the tool and ultimately close. So BDRs really were the initial outreach, meeting generators. Um, and then after about five months of that, I was promoted to one of those sales rep roles. Um, and in turn, had the BDRs then supporting me. Nice. In reflecting on that journey and reflecting on that path, what are some of the things you did early in your career that you did well to set yourself up for success to this path of just getting promoted job after job after job at HubSpot? I, it's funny. It's like, and call me crazy for saying this, it's not rocket science to set yourself apart from the other individuals, your, your, your colleagues, the individuals at your level, if you can do the things that are asked of you just right. For example, I'd show up early every morning. You know, I'd be the one that would be there at 7 a.m. doing my work, getting organized, and trying to be efficient during the day. Um, I'd make best use of the opportunity every single time that I was speaking would say, you know, my CEO, my VP of sales, my sales reps that I supported, I tried to be a sponge. I just listened. You know, like going into a role for the first time, you want to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and that are better at you in the role. So you do so and you ask them what it is that makes them good at what they do. You listen, you ask questions, and you come to find over time the best salespeople are the ones that listen rather than talk. Um, so I guess to answer that, Danny, it's like I did what I think are the easy things. I showed up early. I would leave late. I made my job a priority. I did my best to seek out advice and feedback. And you ultimately try and be a sponge. Um, and, and I think in doing that, I learned over time that um, in order to be a good salesperson, it's, it's listening, but also it's taking a genuine interest in the lives and the businesses of the people that you speak to. Um, you know, like, don't be selfish. You know, recognize at the end of the day, you're trying to help someone and either they're a good fit for what you offer or they aren't, but your goal is to have a conversation about it. It's really well stated, really well stated. And I think a lot of folks get into sales thinking, okay, this is a career that's going to make me a lot of money and get lost along the way in that early stage because, well, whether they have success or whether they don't, it's not necessarily about you. Right when you get into it, you realize quickly, or the good sellers, the good salespeople realize quickly, as you stated, it's about the customer. It's always about the customer. It's about the value you can provide. It's about understanding and being curious about their situation and figuring out, is it a good fit first? And then the money comes after. Um, so that's, that's really well stated, James. And then uh, another question off of that is, what missteps did you have along the way? If any, if any, I don't want to be presumptuous, if any. And, and what did you learn to set yourself up for success? Um. I think a big part of, of being a successful salesperson is having a repeatable process and building routine. Um, it allows you to be efficient. That was something I think I did really, really well. However, to answer your question as to missteps, you can get also extremely comfortable as a salesperson. If you hit quota a few months in a row, you're like, I'm doing great. This is my routine. You fail to iterate and you fail to get better and recognizing where you made mistakes. So I think that there's a development with every salesperson I've hired where, you know, you work on a lot of things, you get them to a certain point, and then 
you think that they're autonomous and they can do everything themselves, but they fail to seek out improvement. And so I usually find it's actually around, let's call it the 12 to 18 month mark of a new salesperson. You sort of get them ramped up and they're good, but then you sometimes see a little bit of a come down. Um, you fail to start, you know, to keep doing the call reviews. You, your, your one-on-ones become, you know, from an hour down to a half hour when you're reviewing things with your manager. Little, little missteps that I was certainly guilty of too when I was a rep. Um, thinking, oh, I've got this. You know, there's nothing I can maybe necessarily really do better, but there really always is. And so you just have to really be observing what's going on around you, the sound bites people do, the approaches that they take. Um, the world's not, you know, the world doesn't stop spinning. You know, you, you've got to always continue to iterate and get better. Yep. Right. You've, you've mentioned a couple of things uh, when it comes to, you know, succeeding in sales and doing well. Uh, and that centers around consistency, centers around building things that are repeatable. What is one sales strategy that has consistently worked for you over the years um, and just simply hasn't changed? And I don't want to call it the, the universal truth of sales, but is there something that, that has kind of stuck? Uh, yeah, I mean, I could go down a rabbit hole with uh, a lot of data. You know, I, I tend to be the type of individual that's pretty analytical. You know, like if I'm a salesperson and I've got a certain amount of hours in a given day and a certain amount of hours over a given week and you've got a quota that you need to hit, I always try and take a step back and think about what are all the steps in order to get there? You know, how many calls typically need to be made, deals that you need to go ahead and technically create or meetings that you need to book. How many demos you need? How many discovery calls? It really, at the end of the day, is an equation. Um, I think my sort of process and routine, those numbers that I always had in my mind, always were something that I had written down. You know, that was the bare minimum that I always needed to go ahead and do. Um, over time, I've found, though, that it's, it's not just about activity or what we usually phrase it up as the inputs. Mm -hmm. You can have salespeople that try really hard, you know, but you'll never close anything. And you try and think why. And to go back to, I think, one of the points we briefly touched on was just, just this notion of like develop a relationship and listen and ask questions. And I've just found over time, my mindset going into a conversation isn't to act like I'm an expert or I'm sure you've been on calls and you're like, I have to turn it up a notch and sound more like a businessman. You know, like that's not the case. You hop on a phone conversation and you try and develop, you know, a relationship with the person on the other end. What's on your mind? You know, what's going on in your neck of the woods? People will naturally gravitate towards what's important for them and what they want to speak about. Just listen. And so that's something I remind uh, a lot of my reps. And I try to remind myself a lot when I was a salesperson is nobody you're speaking to wants to spend $30,000 right now on some type of product you're selling. Like, Get that out of your head. Like you don't have to sound like you, you own a company. You ultimately want to understand, do they have a problem I can help solve? Let the conversation happen, right? Um, at the end of the day, people buy from people. Like it's, it's something really, really important. And I think everything going on in the world right now, you know, selling with empathy, it's, it's more important than ever. You have no idea what people are going through on the other end of a camera. You know, it's it's something that uh, we we've heard from folks that we've we've admired and have done really well in sales, and it's almost like a, a flip of the switch. You know, it, it's a binary thing. You you think about selling one way, and then all of a sudden, your entire strategy, your entire approach changes if you stop, you know, pushing some a product or a service down down people's throats, and instead focus on problems and focus on having conversations with them. I think reps have a challenge of balancing the pragmatic realities of having to hit quota uh, and having senior leadership or folks like you guide them down the, the right path. Because oftentimes if you have bad guidance from senior leaders and the entire focus is on inputs, 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 I think as a rep that doesn't you know, really have a lot of experience, they're going to go down uh, the rabbit hole of you know, doing things the wrong way. And it's just a vicious cycle. So I'm so glad to hear that, you know, this is a, this is something that you truly subscribe to. And, and it, it's something that you're coaching your reps uh, of today and future sales leaders to revisit and rethink the way 
that they sell. We have another question, James, that, that sure. you know, I've been dying to ask you, mostly, mostly because you've spent so much time at HubSpot. And you know, HubSpot is one of these companies that has just pioneered the concept of inbound marketing. And there's a lot of tension and friction sometimes between the sales org and the marketing org. But given that you work at HubSpot, what are your thoughts on the interplay of sales and marketing? I think one really relies on the other. Um, you know, it's a, it's a joint relationship. Uh, it's it's been really interesting seeing it within HubSpot. We call it smarketing. It's always been a, a word we've tossed around. Which um, we've been fortunate in that we built a brand and a great marketing and sales engine before we had a great product. Um, and so the first thing that I'll touch on sort of as a tip is I always recommend to avoid that cycle that you mentioned where senior leadership is maybe pushing bad ideas upon their team. I, I think there has to be a genuine belief that what you're selling is good. You know, like it works, it helps people it's really hard to sell something. The product is awful or your, your mission as a company is not aligned, you know, with, with what you're selling. Um, and I mentioned that because I really did genuinely believe in HubSpot. I saw firsthand how much our marketing team developed content to help people mm -hmm. that ultimately built the top of the funnel, gave us as a sales org, a lot of, you know, insights, companies that were interested in what it is that we had to do. It made that first and second and third conversation so much easier because you knew that this was something that they were genuinely interested or struggled with. So from, from sort of like the sales eye, Marketing does a phenomenal job providing us the types of individuals we want to speak to and helping support us with the type of collateral that addresses the problems and issues that our prospects have. When I think about sort of out of the marketing lens, what sales does is sales provides that feedback, you know, to marketing. Are we both doing the right things? Are we focusing on the right people? Are we helping the right people? Um, and I see it every day with the prospects that we sell to. If they're teams that are siloed, there's no conversation occurring. You speak to someone on sales, marketing is not giving me leads. You speak to someone in marketing, salespeople aren't following up on the leads. There's no um, conversation. And so one thing that I think HubSpot has always aimed as our mission is to make that easy within organizations. Transparency, making sales individuals, um, you know, making the the information about all their prospects visible, giving marketing all of the real-time insights around what the salespeople are doing and what they're acting on and what they like, what they don't like, what they close. You can't have one without the other. And if you've got data um, to, to help both parties out, you know, you're, you're going to be in a, in I think a really good place. So um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's always certainly been interesting as I've looked at my trajectory at HubSpot to, sell software to marketers that we then use ourselves. And now we find it as well. Like we sell a CRM solution that I'm using every day. It makes it a lot easier selling something that you use. Um, that's certainly an advantage. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. A lot of what you said goes back to building transparency and backing that transparency up with data within the organization. So it's not about it's an interpersonal relationship or communication style. It's like, hey, here's what's going on let's both work together to fix it or let's continue to push on it. Now we know the levers so we can then move forward together and it's less. And I do see this a lot, like you were saying in sales where it's one person feels one way and one person feels another way. And that's where the communication breakdown happens. And it's not a sales versus marketing thing. It's just, uh, Hey, we've got different metrics of success. So it's, it's cool to see you put that in motion at HubSpot. And, and frankly, from the, blog that you put out and the literature you have out in the in the wild I, I would be shocked you know if, if you didn't because you guys are the industry leaders there too you know plenty of our folks look at HubSpot blog uh, or look at the HubSpot blog on a day-to-day -day basis just to get insight into what it's like to be an SDR uh, and, and, and I want to transition a little bit to, to the SDR role um, because it is such an important role. It's important in sales, it's important today, and hopefully in the future. What, what's your vision for where the SDR role, uh, or what the SDR role becomes, you know, a year, three years, five years down the line? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, so right now, uh, our organization, I think we've got something like within our segment, there are about maybe 30 BDRs that are supporting us. Um, hands down, the best BDRs are the ones that are naturally curious, 
they've got great business acumen, or they're willing to improve their business acumen. Um, and they're motivated, you know, they've got something that they're striving for. Um, you know, there's an individual that I'm thinking of literally right now, she's one of our top EDRs and she's only been at HubSpot for two months. The reason why is she, she's extremely motivated. Um, not just like compensation wise, she's motivated to like, learn, learn more. Um, and I think that SDR role, when you really pin it, yeah, you peel back the onion you need to be able to quickly pivot and speak to anyone about their business. In order to do that, you have to ask the right questions, but you also have to understand as crazy as it sounds like how business works, you know, like what is the flow chart of this business? How do they make money? All right. They target these types of people. This is how much one of their widgets costs or their service Here's what happens upon getting this client. Here's how they make them happy. Here's how they sell more of it. When you can grasp that about anyone, you know, in a business, you're able to go ahead and pivot and then ask much better questions as it is that you, you know, grow and move forward as an SDR. So I always say like, as an SDR, you are a business consultant. You are trying to identify within a business what's broken. It's really hard for a 22 or 23 year old who's never managed a team who's never worked within a business before to go ahead and do that. Um, and so I think where that SDR role is, is going is I ideally would love to see a group of SDRs that are extremely intelligent, that are basically consultants in a, in a you know, respect, uh, and that are extremely motivated, able to pivot and quick and be a sponge and learn and be naturally curious. I think, um, I think the role of an SDR and a salesperson has changed in the 10 years since, uh, since I've basically been in a hub spot. Um, and, uh, and I usually just tend to find the most successful. It's, it's not that you have to be extroverted or introverted. I mean, some of the sales, best salespeople at HubSpot, you'll never speak to over Slack. They're just, you know, in their own zone, but they have good, genuine human conversations with everyone that they're speaking to. Yeah, that's great. Act like a consultant, you know, find pain, the, the, the stuff that, is important about sales. You're just doing it earlier in your career. My question then becomes, and since you've had such great, robust experience managing SDRs is how do you screen for that? What's the thing you look for in an interview that says, okay, this person is going to be able to consult or identify those pain points in a business right away, especially as a young 22, 23 year old coming out of college. Sure. Sure. Um, it's not easy. I'd say BDRs are some of the hardest people to hire hands down because there's nothing concrete most of the time that you can sort of grasp on to say, Oh, you know, they did this job. Great. You know, all right. You have, you have so little experience at that point. Um, however, uh, in interviewing BDRs or SDRs as, as we call them, I usually like to look at a couple of things. Um, you know, what jobs did they hold? Were they in a job that, you know, for lack of a better phrase, like nobody would probably ever want to do. Um, and, and, you know, they, they did it well, you know, because that's basically what sales is, is dealing a lot with rejection, being able to pivot and, and come back from, from rejection very, very easily. Um, in addition, did they go outside, uh, you know, what was asked of them? Um, you know, basically sales, you know, is, is doing what a lot of people don't want to do when no one's watching, you know, like, you need to show that you've done that before. You know, nobody asked you to be the, the captain of a team or to learn an instrument, you know, from, from scratch your freshman year of college. Um, I want to know about genuine experiences where you taught yourself something because that demonstrates commitment, curiosity, um, and, you know, dedicating towards, uh, dedicating yourself towards something that nobody asked you to go ahead and do. Those are, I think, all properties that are really, really important. Um, the, uh, the last item though, is what are the questions you're going to ask me in an interview? I've always been an advocate that when you're interviewing, you're certainly going ahead and going and going to answer questions about your past and your history and what you do. The best BDRs ask me the best questions, you know, like I I've had BDRs ask me like, you know, what, what sets the, uh, the great BDRs apart from the good ones? You know, tell me specifically what they do. Where do you feel like HubSpot's going and how the SDR role is going to go ahead and be changing over the year. Um, you know, you've seen SDRs get promoted. What is it that they physically do that's different to get them promoted quicker than others? 
I want to see that curiosity. I want to see that they're actually thinking about where do they fit amidst the rest of the business. So, so I guess a couple of things to answer your question. Uh, you know, when you when you simplify it down, it's you know looking at past history and have they done something outside of what's asked of them? Have they done it with over a hundred percent? Are they able to teach themselves something? Because you're you know your first job, you're you get hit really hard with the notion that you don't have a parent that's going to go ahead and baby you through it. You know, like you have to be able to learn yourself and, and dedicate time towards it without anybody telling you to. Um, and then the questions you ask, is this person genuinely curious, you know, curious, do they have genuine curiosity? Um, we also do a role play, you know, is this individual someone who can, you know, speak over the phone, you, you know, they're not, they're not a whisperer. You know, there are little things like that, that, Unfortunately, you know, you only find when it is that they're, you know, in the actual seat um, that we also try and screen for a little bit doing a role play. That's a that's a nice process that you have out there. And, you know, quite honestly, some of the things that you mentioned um, all seem very reasonable, showing some kind of initiative, um, being thoughtful about the interview process, um, asking questions stemming from, you know, general curiosity. Unfortunately, the way the world is set up today with the recruiting process for a lot of early career jobs. And we've seen this across the border, whether it's sales or not sales is we've moved to a world where we've just removed any kind of barrier. Um, all you need to do is just have one resume and mass apply like crazy. If there's something broken about the recruiting process for early career jobs, it's that as a student, you just go in there, go from website to website to website and just keep applying and think of it as a numbers game. Mm -hmm. uh, but to your point, I think being a little more thoughtful may help you narrow down uh, that activity. Maybe you only have to do it 50 times and be very thoughtful about it as opposed to spraying and praying, which honestly translates into sales as well. When, <laughs> when you go about prospecting, there's, there's, the, you know, there's the, the right way of doing it. And then there's just throwing everything against the wall and seeing what sticks. Thank you for that. Uh, very, very insightful. We'll, we'll ask you one question um, and, 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 and wrap it up. You've been so generous with your time. You've spent about 10 years at HubSpot. You've learned quite a bit, done really well, uh, coached and mentored others. If you could go back in time and find a version of yourself graduating from Tufts and you could give yourself just one piece of advice, what would that be? Join HubSpot earlier. <laughs> given the, given the, I don't know if you've seen the stock price today, but like 100%, I was like, if I had six months earlier, I would have been here. Oh, man, would have, would have been nice. But no, that's, that's uh, a, a pipe dream. Um, that is a good question. I mean, I mean, if I if I look back as a recent graduate at Tufts, I, I think any recent graduate sort of feels as if that um, what's the phrase? Not that they're immune, but like that nothing can can hurt them, right? Like you come out when you have your first job, like you don't have to stay there for a year. I that, that that's actually something really important that I I want to stress is I had this job and a lot of people who I trusted and sought out advice from told me, no, give it a year. You know, you don't want to have something on your resume that says you've only been there for five months. And I can't stress it enough. If you don't feel it, you're not having fun and you're not enjoying it. Get the hell out of there. You have a good reason, right? Like I was not motivated to go into work because, and you, you know, be honest with it. I could care less if someone has their first job, they were there for five months and they left as long as it is, you have a good reason for it. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't like waking up early. Like, come on. It's, it's more of like, if you found yourself, if you didn't feel like you were adding value or you weren't getting out enough from the role that you wanted and you're seeking out more, that's fine. So I tell you, tell everyone, if I was like a 23 year old, 22 year old, again, I'd say it's okay to go ahead and, and leave something five or six months into it, if it's legitimate, you know, certainly stick it out. If it's really, you know, be self-aware and look at yourself. Is this a me thing or is it like the company? Um, but that was one of the best decisions I've ever made was hands down quitting, going against advice. Cause I just really didn't feel it. And certainly seek out maybe an opportunity before you quit, you know, as, as sort of a, a backup, but um, that was the best decision I've ever made. And, and I think it probably goes against some, uh, advice maybe from others, but 
if you have a legitimate reason and you can explain it and it's genuine, um, I don't see a reason why, why you should stay. Thank you for sharing that. It, coming from you, it adds so much legitimacy to, to normalizing, you know, not spending excessive amounts of time at an, at an, uh, at an environment that's not ideal for you. I, I think that it's a relic of the past, this whole stick around for two years. Uh, it looks bad on your resume. Who cares at the end of the day, if it's sort of a legitimate reason, it doesn't matter uh, at all, especially early on professionally, because you don't even know if sales is for you. Right. I'll, I'll add something else on, on top of it. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's you and you simply do not like it. Right. You thought you liked it, but you don't. It's OK. Don't waste your employer's time. Don't waste your time. Um, and life is short. So that is an incredible piece of uh, piece of advice. And I think that's the first time we've heard that. So thank you for sharing that. We agree with right. you. And uh, again, coming from you, that's seen some level of success. Like no one's going to you know, say, oh, James, like you're not qualified to, you know, say that because you've stuck around, man. I don't think there's a lot of people that have stayed 10 years at a company. You have. Yeah. Right? They're, so. they're, you know, the amount of friends that I have that have been somewhere for, for 10 years, I can only count on one hand. So anyone that's listening to it, uh, it's okay. If you're in a bad atmosphere, a bad environment, it's not a fit. Life is short. Find something else that makes you happy. Uh, James, thank you so much for, you know, spending a, a Friday morning with us. Uh, really appreciate your time. I'm positive that anyone that listens to this podcast will find tremendous value from your story and your experience. Uh, again, from Danny and uh, Danny and me, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. It was great speaking with you both. Have a, uh, a wonderful weekend. You as well. Thanks, James. You too.